Hi friends and welcome. If you're new here, my name's Katya Weinert and I review books of any genre. Today I'll be reviewing a classic, Adam Bede by George Eliot. I'm going to start off by telling you a little bit about the blurb of the book, a little bit about George Eliot, and then I'm going to go into a spoiler section. So before I do that, I'll let you know, because if you're interested in reading it, you're certainly not going to want to hear all of my thoughts about all the characters. Before I do, I'd like to give a shout out to Tori at Hufflepuff Discovery. Thank you so much for recommending this as a buddy read. It was our first buddy read, either one of us. I loved being able to have messages back and forth on Instagram, and I do um, feel bad for Tori for drawing the short straw with me because I started reading this at a time when work was extremely busy and I fell behind so I had to let her go ahead quite a bit on her own. Um, but other than that I really enjoyed my first buddy read and I especially enjoyed just a few moments ago having a video conference call with Tori. It made me think you know, actually, this book <laughs> lends itself, or any book maybe, but this book lent itself really well to a face-to-face -face discussion with Tori, and it's got me wondering whether I should do that with my next buddy read, actually have a video conference um, that we can share afterwards, so I'm, I'm really excited about that. I think it worked so well. I liked hearing Tori's ideas while I'm talking to her. It made me think about the characters in a different way and see certain situations from a new perspective as well, which works a little bit through the messaging on Instagram, but as a conversation worked so much more. So I'm getting a little bit excited about that. I better concentrate on what I'm doing, which is reviewing this book. So back to the book. Adam Bede was written in 1859 by George Eliot. It's her first book. If I had written this as my first book, I would be so proud. Please excuse that I have defaced this poor little lamb on the cover. I realized that I had like the worst cover. I tried to draw around it and then I realized I don't know anything about drawing or art. But anyway, I digress. 1859, she wrote this book. It was her first full-length novel and she immediately was catapulted into the realm of recognition of like Charles Dickens. And she had to write um, under a male name, even though other people at that time, other women were already writing under their own names, purely because she wanted to be judged on uh, being an author, writing about society, rather than being judged as a female author. Um, and it was a very good move because for a very long time, people didn't know that George Eliot was a woman. They made several assumptions about which clergyman she could be in the local area in the, the East Midlands. Um, and someone even tried to nick her work, <laughs> nick, um, pinch her work. So tried to take the recognition for her writing by going, oh yeah, yeah, that was me. And I think he even got payment. So I, I won't read you the entire introduction because it's that thick. So it, it is substantial, it gives you loads of information about her life and what happened. Um, very interesting life. Religion features quite um, heavily in the book and it's never in a preachy way. It is actually quite appropriate to the time and um, to the community. So uh, we've got some Methodist preachers in here. And what I would say is, um, although we've got one of the characters who's reading the Bible quite a bit, George Eliot, as uh, a person, was aware of societal expectation, and I think her take on religion within the book um, leans towards acceptance of people and love. So that comes across very clearly with her character of Dinah, who is uh, the cousin of another character, but she's also a, a lay preacher, a Methodist lay preacher. And George Eliot herself um, experienced a lot of societal judgment because another reason for her writing under the name of a male author is because she was living with a married man who is also an author. But she was living with a married man and that meant that she was estranged from the rest of her family, even though she lived with him for 24 years and he was pretty much her soulmate. Um, 
they stayed together until his death and uh, she then married um, two years later. Set in the English Midlands of farmers and village craftsmen at the turn of the 18th century, the book relates a story of seduction issuing in the inward suffering, which is the worst form of nemesis. I think that's quite a convoluted way to describe that. Unpick that as you will. Um, I think the next bit's a little bit more straightforward in terms of the blurb. It is also a rich and pioneering record, drawing on the intimate knowledge and affectionate memory of a rural world that we have lost. The movement of the narration between social realism and reflection on its own processes, the exploration of motives, and the constant authorial presence all bespeak an art that strives to connect the fictional with the actual. I think that makes sense. This certainly made the fictional seem actual. The characters are wonderfully complex and I can imagine them stepping off the page and being people today. Aside from the vernacular, the way they talk and perhaps their mannerisms, um, the thinking behind their decisions, their motives. I can imagine that today. So it's called Adam Bede, but for the first half of the book, I almost thought, why is it called Adam Bede? Yes, we've got the character, but there are so many other characters that we're following. Is it really his story? And ultimately, yes, it is, but it is also the other character's story. And by the other characters, I mean Hetty Sorrel, Captain Arthur Donnythorne, and Dinah Morris. Those four characters are the key people. There are other wonderful side characters like Adam's brother, Seth, but the focus is really with these four people who form a very odd sort of love rectangle. Don't be put off and run away from the book now because you think, gosh, that sounds cheesy. Because it isn't cheesy, it is not particularly in your face love rectangle. There are a lot of instances where there's some sort of digression, almost philosophizing, um, which I don't think is uncommon for a classic. I think if it was edited today, this book would be much shorter. Still really love it. And I am certainly going to pick up more George Eliot. I, I was thinking of going to Silas Marner next, but then I've decided that Middlemarch is the better choice because there are so many other authors who just think that it is one of the most wonderful books that they've read. Um, for instance, Virginia Woolf and Martin Amos. So next I'm going to go into the spoilers and thanks so much if you joined me up until this point. Do leave me a comment if you're thinking about reading George Eliot or even Adam Bede itself and uh, look forward to um, chatting with you again next time. If you're still here, onto the spoiler section. So I'm assuming that you are either choosing not to read the book and therefore don't mind hearing a bit more about it, or you have read it and you'd like to know whether I have similar ideas to what you might have done when you read it. So let us go back to the love rectangle. Adam loves Hetty. Hetty loves only herself, but is attracted to Captain Donnythorne. Captain Donnythorne wants to be liked by everyone, so he likes her attention, likes Hetty's attention, who in turn loves having attention, so they're a perfect match in some ways. And then you've got Dinah, who loves just everyone, because she believes that her whole purpose on this earth is to shoulder our burdens. So if you have Dinah in your sphere, she would be the person who is there during the times of trouble and she doesn't mind you sort of discarding her when you're doing okay. She believes that that is her calling. How does she fit into a love rectangle becomes apparent as you continue with the story. But Adam, of course, is quite a successful uh, carpenter in his community. He has got a great reputation for being a good, solid guy who um, would be a catch to any woman in that community. And he's got his eye on Hetty, who's the most beautiful girl in all of Hayslop. Hetty, although, is also the most selfish, self-absorbed creature in Hayslop, which Adam's mother is very quick to point out to him. 
but he doesn't hear it, he doesn't see it. He believes she's just young, she's going to be able to grow out of her immaturity and she will therefore start to become a very caring, loving, helpful sort of person. All the characteristics that she doesn't actually have. Hetty, in the meantime, knows that Adam likes her, because which man in the community wouldn't? Captain Donnythorne, however, is the object of her desires, because he would offer her the opportunity to step out of her humdrum existence and become a grand lady. Actually, that can't happen, because there are societal expectations, and Captain Donnythorne can't marry that far below his social rank. So very much just Hetty dreaming. Um, but what happens is that Captain Donathorn can't resist this attractive girl showing an interest in him. I mean, he's already interested, he's flirted a bit, and he thinks, ooh, this could go somewhere. But then he starts to think better of it. He's like, ooh, but this wouldn't be appropriate, and um, I'll not encourage it. When circumstances sort of lead them to come together again and she bats her eyelashes at him and starts to cry, he's like, oh, I don't like anyone feeling, you know, ill disposed to me. I have to be that guy who everyone likes. So let me just smooch her and let's just take this further. So he gives her loads of attention, expensive earrings and vain hopes. This leaves Dinah. She is the first person there at times of grief for people. It's actually how we first noticed her in Adam Bede because Adam's father passes away and the expectation would be that someone in the community would, you know, support his family during their time of grief. And rather than Hetty coming across and helping them out and helping Adam's mother, for example, it's actually her cousin, who they don't know very well, who comes over and stays and supports them and helps them. So you've got Dinah, who is a very different sort of character. She's got self-awareness, um, unlike the other three. So, I mean, Adam's not that bad at self-awareness, but there are certain character flaws in himself that he doesn't recognize until much later. Whereas Dinah sees her own flaws and everything, but she doesn't choose to act on anything until that point where she realizes that she can trust her own heart's desires without becoming a bad person or being led entirely off the path of being a righteous person. She doesn't want to live like the rest of people in a way because she thinks that her higher calling is all about self-sacrifice and doing what God wants her to do. But at some point in the story, you realize that she is starting to understand that being able to trust her heart and just being human is an okay thing. So we've got those four characters as our main ingredient to the story here. And for me, I don't know what it was like for you, but for me, it was quite shocking, the turn of events. But we start off, of course, with um, Adam discovering that Captain Donnythorne and Hetty are having an affair. He thinks that he's caught them right at the start of the flirtation and Captain Donnythorne doesn't dissuade him from that. He actually says, you know, it was just a kiss sort of thing. So Adam makes sure that Captain Donnythorne does the right thing and breaks things off with Hetty, which is something that um, Donnythorne really resents because he's kind of like the sort of character who would have liked the affair to have fizzled out on its own rather than him actively having to do something to correct what he'd done wrong in the first place. So when he does break things off with Hetty, who's, you know, naturally disappointed, realizing that, no, she's not going to be a grand lady, I thought that that was it. And, um, the t you know, the story might progress with her being really resentful and then Adam having regrets and whatever else um, in terms of them getting married, because she does go on to accept Adam's marriage proposal, right? But when I realized, along with the rest of Hayslop, because that was the real twist, you know, you don't know what's happening with Hetty until the moment the whole of Hayslop knows that she is being tried uh, for the murder of her child. And you're like, what child? What? <laughs> so along with Adam, who's totally in shock, you realize um, as the story progresses that she managed to hide her pregnancy um, which she didn't know about when she was dumped by Captain Donathorn. But before marrying 
Adam, she decides to go find Captain Donathorn to find Arthur and tell him that she's pregnant. And um, she's feeling quite suicidal, so you actually feel sympathetic towards her, which I kind of resented feeling sympathetic towards Hetty because she's been just so self-absorbed up until this point. But I certainly felt the sympathy for her when the story starts to develop. And so you learn that she goes off to find um, Arthur. And I, I don't know how you felt about this, but <laughs> I thought to myself, there are so many opportunities before she decides to do that, to actually, you know, say to her adoptive parents, the Poisers, this is what's happened. But she's like, oh, you know, all these people who've offered me help in the past are going to judge me and um, are such know-it-alls, I don't want to give them the satisfaction. Is that is that what she's thinking? Is that why she hasn't gone to them? She has every opportunity to develop really strong bonds with people in her community and the people surrounding her, including Dinah, who offered her help and said, anytime you need anything, please come to me. And she doesn't. She doesn't form any of these meaningful bonds with the people in her sphere. She is just so much in her own head with her own um, wants and needs. And it is so frustrating really really frustrating and there's certain you know little nuances throughout the book that um i thought about so for example you've got her adoptive parents um daughter totty who has lived with hetty all her life but really has no interest in going to hetty because she knows hetty has no interest in her um then you have dinah coming in who's hardly been in the poisers house and um this toddler feels safe and able to be with Dinah, which really I thought was some foreshadowing that I hadn't foreseen. So, you know, in hindsight, it's foreshadowing because you have got a child knowing that Hetty is not going to have her interests at her heart. So you've got Adam at the start who seems quite rigid in his ways and quite judgmental of people. He doesn't have the same soft-heartedness about him that Seth does. He's not a bad guy. Everyone in town thinks he's great. But if you think about it, his dad didn't measure up to his standards because of the alcoholism and not being able to support the family. You've got his disappointment in Captain Donathorn, who he saw as uh, someone who is of the higher society, who would actually have been able to respect people of a lower standing. But then uh, disrespects um, Hetty, her family, her community by starting that affair with her. And it, at that point, Adam also discovers that his view of the world could get him into big trouble because he punches Captain Donathorn, thinks that he's actually killed the man because he lays him out flat. And he's thinking, gosh, I'm a good man. And is he dead? <laughs> and I think it's that, again, in hindsight, I think he realizes that good people can do bad things um, because he was caught up in the heat of the moment and he, he was filled with such self-righteous anger towards this man. Adam's growth for me was interesting because he goes on to, obviously he feels angry at Hetty uh, for having hidden her pregnancy. But he stays for the whole trial. There is no societal expectation for him to still be there for her. But he almost remains like, almost on the one hand, like someone who would have been looking after her um, as a partner, you know, mutual support. But not really. It's almost paternal. It ends up being almost paternal because what could it be with Hetty? And in so doing, he hears all the tragic backstory, which is that Hetty um, has a child while she's looking for Arthur Donathorn. The woman who helps her have this child is a stranger in the town and um, has to go testify to say, yes, um, this woman had a child because Hetty is in denial and refuses to acknowledge that she had a child. So this woman testifies and of course the doctors know that she's had a child. Hetty's confession took so long to actually be made and I thought that was very clever on the part of George Eliot about the character of Hetty because she's always in denial about um, anything that would require her to have any sort of responsibility and this is a huge, huge responsibility, a huge 
terrible thing that she's done. And it's only when Dinah stays with her day in, day out in her jail cell that she starts to unburden herself. And the reason she does so, I think, is mainly driven um, by the realization of, you know, her being likely to be executed. And then she is, of course, given um, the execution order. And then she admits that she not only had the child, but rather than leaving her um, where she had this baby, she takes the child into the woods and abandons her there for a day. And it's not until the following morning that she goes back because she says she's plagued by hearing the cries of the baby, which I think is, you know, perhaps subconscious guilt. But really, her main focus in telling that is that she herself is plagued and she, her feelings about, oh, I'm hearing the baby cry, so therefore I went. It's less about feeling for that child. Um, it was, it's really tragic. You do feel bad for Hetty, but ultimately she leaves a helpless baby in the woods overnight and the baby dies of exposure. So she is rightly um, accused, she's rightly caught and imprisoned, and uh, they decide that she should be executed. And then you've got Captain Donnythorne coming in at the last minute and transmuting that uh, sentence um, with his political influence or societal influence, um, gets her transported to Australia. Dinah and Adam, I thought, was a really lovely love story. It's a slow uh, burner, and in fact, they would probably not have gotten together if it weren't for other minor characters um, making it happen. Captain Donathorne, I thought, was a weak character, but um, strongly written. So those are my thoughts on the book. Let me know what you thought. As always, thanks for joining me. Take care. Bye.